Let's pray. You are the God in whom I take refuge. Our Father in heaven, send out your light and your truth, we pray. Let them lead us and bring us to your holy hill. And we pray that one day we will go to the altar of our God. And to you, our exceeding joy, and praise you. So for those of us who are cast down in soul at the moment, revive us, renew us. And let us know your love, your light, your truth. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you weren't here yesterday, in these early afternoon sessions, we're following uh, through the theme of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. Uh, One of my contentions beginning uh, was that there is a tendency to focusing on the priestly work of Christ um, to the detriment of his prophetic and his kingly work, and a tendency even within the priestly work of Christ to focus just on the cross, and within that, almost exclusively on penal substitution. Uh, Today, we're going to come to that priestly work. And so we will spend a decent amount of time thinking about uh, the cross, the atonement, propitiation. But let me begin by reading the the 25th question of the, the Shorter Catechism, which asks the question, what, or rather, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? And here, as I read the answer... The the two halves, as it were, the first referring to Christ's ministry in the days of his humiliation, and the second, his ongoing ministry now as a priest in his exaltation. How does Christ execute the office of a priest? He does so in his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God, and in making continual intercession for us. That really is what we're going to explore Uh, now together. The once and for all work of the cross and the ongoing intercessory work of Christ uh, in heaven. So same structure, it's going to be the same structure every day. Uh, We'll begin by looking at the work of Christ as priest in his humiliation. If you wanted a key verse, it's a verse that comes time and time again when you uh, get into the literature a little bit. Hebrews 5.1. Hebrews 5.1 gives three core elements of what it means to be a priest. Hebrews 5.1, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. There is a classic summary verse of the work of Christ the priest. Three elements. First of all, he has to represent the people. He has to come from the people. In that sense, and we'll qualify this later, but in that sense, it is a down-up direction. The prophetic office is very obviously an up, down, from high to low, God to man. Priestly work is directed up from among men. Again, there are qualifications to that. But a priest must represent the people. And the corollary of that, the second element, is it is priestly work is directed towards God. Atonement, and indeed intercession, In fact, every aspect of Christ's priestly work, ultimately, is first and foremost directed towards God. And then the third element, pretty obviously there, at the end of the verse, it is about offering gifts and sacrifices for sins. Christ is both the sacrifice and the offerer, the priest and the sacrifice. I've I've not done the kind of word studies or counted all the verses or anything, but I, I, I think that it's right to say that the weight of the New Testament, not exclusive, but the weight of the New Testament is on the active offering of Christ. Rather than Christ being the kind of the sacrificial victim, rather it's the active offering of himself where, where the burden uh, falls. In other words, Christ's work as priest it is active in nature. Now, he is not simply the passive victim, the slain lamb. Uh, what is this? How does this work out in, in the days of his humiliation? The temptation is to run straight to Calvary, straight to Golgotha. But let's slow down a little bit on that road. 
There's a very striking uh, question in the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, Question 37 um, says this, during all the time he, Christ, lived on earth, but especially at the end, Christ bore in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. Does anything jump out at you there? During all the time he lived on earth, but especially at the end. I think I'd be tempted to say it's just the end. Christ's priestly work begins as the first nail goes in, or perhaps it begins in Gethsemane. But the writers of the Catechism obviously thought, thought differently. And so as we walk that, that Calvary road, we see that the priestly ministry of Christ begins really from his earliest days. We can think about the circumcision of Christ on the eighth day. Circumcision is about, about blood cutting, isn't it? A cutting off. Luke 2.21, at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The name is announced, you will call his name Jesus. But Jesus is actually given the name Jesus, the saving name, at his circumcision. In the first shedding, as, as, as Edward says, the first shedding of propitiatory blood. Jesus' life begins and ends in bloodshed. Begins and ends in a cutting off. From the eighth day, it is clear where he's going. And indeed, as the the Passover lamb, the the symbolism fits the Passover lamb. Do you remember it's chosen on the tenth day, but not sacrificed until the fourteenth? There is a period of preparation. There's so much we could say about Christ's life, and clearly we won't have time to. We thought yesterday about the, the... Incredible passage in Isaiah, morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear. As slowly Christ grows in understanding of what he has come to do. And we remember that, when we remember rather, that that this is the Son of God. It's a reminder that that every step along that road was for our sake. A few years ago I was sat, sat here and it was the... The year that the, uh, the theme of the conference was on the doctrine of God. Uh, one of the speakers quoted a theologian whose name I can't pronounce, uh, and I'm not even going to try. Uh, but I can tell you the quote. And the quote was this, God plus the universe is not greater than God alone. It was just one of those lines that, that struck me. Do you ever have that? Just something really hits home. God plus the universe is not greater than God alone. It doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Surely if you've got one thing and then you add another thing, you've got more things. But that's not the case with God, mysteriously. God lacked nothing, as we said yesterday. He needed nothing. The Son of God lacked nothing. The Son of God needed nothing. And therefore, we're reminded that that every step along the Calvary Road is for love. He has nothing to gain. Yes, Christ, according to his human nature, is rewarded with the kingdom. There's much we might say for the joy set before him. But as God, if you, if you like, go right back to first principles, there was no gain for God. It is all love. We run to the cross. But Christ was circumcised for you. He was homeless for you, baptized for you, scorned for you, rejected for you, betrayed for you for you, put on trial for you, whipped and scourged for you, blasphemed for you. There's a Dutch minister, theologian, called Klaas Schilder, of whom I understand very, very little. Uh, But I was reading one one of his books the other day, and I read this. In the last analysis, he, Jesus, saw no fundamental difference between a toothache and the day of judgment. Now, don't misunderstand that, or at least I don't know quite what Schilder means, <laughs> but I can tell you what I, what I found striking about it. He's not saying Christ had toothache and getting into the debates about the body of Christ or anything like that. But what he's saying, I think, or, or trying to sort of get at, is that, that Christ knew that all that, is, all that is wrong in this world is a result of the fall, is a result of sin and the ensuing curse, the pain, the suffering. 
It's all a result of Genesis 3. He reads the world rightly. So in the same way as he would see the sparrows and see the goodness of God, the lilies clothed in the field and see in a way that we are so blind that we, we, we fail to notice, see again the kindness and generosity of God. Well, so too he would see that the signs of judgment everywhere. And he uniquely would know that ultimately one day that judgment in full would be poured on him. And so what I think Shilder is getting at is even the tiniest little sign of the curse, toothache, was just a little glimmer of the fires that Christ would be consumed by when he gets to Golgotha. And on and on he went for you, growing, learning, deepening, and never turning his face. Eventually he comes to, to Gethsemane. And it seems there that, that um, in, in those last moments, he has shown uh, the fullness of the horror of what is about to happen. Uh, the cup is shown to him. I guess somebody says so much to us, doesn't it? As he sees that the wrath that is to come, it makes the Son of God sweat blood. We see sin as such a trifling matter. But he, of course, has to go willingly. He must jump. He cannot be pushed. And so he needs to know what is coming. And so God reveals it to him as fully as it ever can be before the actual nails are are, are driven in. Some of you may know that the sermon of uh, of Edwards called Christ's Agony. Edwards points out there's there's two things at least going on in Gethsemane. Uh, First of all is the obvious point. He's being shown how awful it will be to come under the judgment of God. But Edwards goes further than, than, than perhaps we might do with our kind of surface level exegesis, further than I would ever have gone anyway. Edwards points out that, that therefore, because Christ is being shown the cup, he is being shown how wicked those he's about to die for really are, because he knows God is just. This is not an unfair cup. This is a, a, a deserved cup. He's being shown in all the fullness, therefore, not just the wrath of God, but knowing it is the just wrath of God, he's being shown the wickedness of his people. And still he goes. He knows what you are like, and still he goes. He knows what it would cost, and still he goes. Again and again, the love of God. On he goes into the darkness, into the fire. To the cross itself. And so we come to the cross as Christ's altar. Yesterday, his pulpit. But the cross as Christ's altar. Hebrews 5, 1 again. Every high priest is selected from among the people and appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer sacrifices and gifts for sins. It is a verse... Uh, that clarifies the atonement is fundamentally Godward in its direction. A a verse that rules out any understanding of the atonement uh, that takes as its its primary direction the influence the cross has upon us. Again, we're not going to walk through all the supposed theories of the atonement uh, this afternoon. And it's not as if you have to pick one understanding and make that sort of everything, of course. The the cross speaks to us in all sorts of ways, as I hope it's coming across. But the the cross cannot be merely a moral influence if priestly work is directed towards God. Uh, Was the cross necessary? Well, it depends what you mean, doesn't it? Uh, God's wrath at sin, his justified wrath at sin, is from his very nature, not his will, isn't it? Not that wrath is an attribute of God. It would be strange to to describe wrath as an an attribute of God in the same way as we describe the the holiness of God as an attribute of God or the the goodness of God as an attribute. Uh, We we could think of God as eternally loving, eternally wise. We wouldn't think of him as eternally wrathful. But justice is, if you like, an eternal attribute and wrath is the, the, the term uh, the scriptures use for what happens when a sinner meets a holy, just God. 
Of course, if many want, many want to, to sideline the idea of the wrath of God nowadays, but in doing so, we actually undermine his love. Uh, if wrath was just from God's will rather than from his character, then it would be unnecessary. He could just lay it aside if he wanted. And the work of Christ becomes a kind priest trying to persuade an angry judge to just calm down. But actually, when we safeguard the justice and the just wrath of God, we safeguard the love. There was no other way. And yet still he went. So was the atonement necessary? Well, in one sense, no. Of course it wasn't necessary in that it was gracious. Again, we must safeguard that, mustn't we? That there was no obligation of God to come and save. But, again, using such human language, once he had decided to rescue, there cannot surely have been any other way. There is, in, in Murray's language, a consequent absolute necessity. Why? Because of what sin deserves, what sin leads to. I think there are two primary categories, if you like, uh, of punishment due to sinners. Uh, the first uh, are all to do with the loss of God's favor, uh, a separation from all that is good and therefore ultimately from God himself. Think of 2 Thessalonians 1.9 that describes hell as the place where people will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Think of the covenant curses, right from Eden onwards, being driven away from God, cut off. It is a punishment of deprivation. But at the same time, there are other occasions where the punishment due for sin is active, Wrath and curse. Think of the verses that speak of hell as a place where those will be tormented forever in the presence of the Lamb. And then we'd have to choose between them. The sort of deprivation type punishment and the active torment imagery are all trying to convey the horror of judgment the seriousness of sin. And therefore, they let us know too what Christ as priest must walk through if he's going to take that wrath in our place. Now let's start with a, with a loss of favor. Perhaps expressed most clearly in the, in the cry of dereliction, dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, that Jesus cries out uh, on the cross. Uh, the, the world has gone dark, isn't it? And it is it is hard to walk into that darkness. Yes, I'm sure that the darkness is letting us know that God's wrath is being poured out on Christ, the imagery of the plagues of Amos. But there is, I think, too, a cloaking to the darkness. It's easy to begin to think there are some doctrines that, that, that you put in the kind of mystery pile. The Trinity, predestination, sovereignty and responsibility. And some doctrines that are just, just easy. We can get our heads around with a bit of thought, doctrine of scripture. Or, and into that pile, it's, it's easy to begin to think we can put the cross. We've done our little kind of kiddie illustrations, all, all the sin was on me, and the book cuts us off from God, and we put it on the hand. And, and of course, you can explain penal substitution to, to a child. But that doesn't mean there aren't endless depths to the cross. It doesn't mean there is no mystery. Christ is crucified in the darkness the very first gift we heard of yesterday, light was given and now withdrawn. The light of the world himself cloaked in darkness. We're fools if we think we've fathomed the atonement. Let me walk through some things I want to suggest to you we should not say, and yet you do hear, again, staying on this theme of what it means for Christ to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, to go through the, the supposed abandonment uh, first, we should not say, I suggest, that the Trinity is torn apart. Here's a quote from a popular conservative evangelical book on the Trinity, and I'll give you no more detail than that. The Father and the Son love one another with a perfect love through eternity. To see Jesus is to know the Father. But now they're torn apart. The divine community is broken. 
The Father and the Son, who mutually indwell one another, are separated. The Father experiences the loss of his Son. The Son endures the judicial abandonment of his Father. Jesus dies bearing the full effects of sin, the full force of God's wrath. He is alone and abandoned. The distinction of the divine persons is expressed in the most extreme way. God is divided from God. That God should be divided from God only makes sense if God is a Trinitarian community. Only if there's some distinction within God, could it ever be possible for God to be forsaken by God? You see it elsewhere. I've seen counselling material again from from good organisations where... couples going through marriage breakup were being addressed and the line taken was if your relationships are falling apart in a way you never believed could happen don't despair even the trinity was torn apart once and then reconciled so there's hope too for your marriage however well meaning that may be that is at the end of the day heresy you cannot tear the trinity apart god does not change God in himself does not suffer. As Calvin puts it, surely God does not have blood, does not suffer, cannot be touched with hands. God is not confined to time as if he was living through the experience of the cross. As if for a few hours the Trinity was reduced to a a binity plus one. Ultimately, the Son of God is the one God. There is one essence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the cross is not Father versus Son in Trinitarian terms, but rather God punishing man, a human suffering, but the human nature of the divine Son. No ruptures in the Trinity, nor the divine and human natures of Christ torn apart. Again, you see it occasionally, perhaps less commonly than the torn Trinity. The incarnation is not being undone as as Christ cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not human Jesus crying to divine Jesus, whatever on earth that would mean anyway. I mean, if the two natures were torn apart, then actually the atonement loses its value. You are left with one man dying, not the son of God dying in his human nature. One man dying is not going to ransom the nations. And of course, the incarnation is never undone, never reversed. Uh, nor thirdly, is it, is it a, a confused cry of Christ? You see this sometimes more in commentaries, actually. Some of the commentaries, you may have read these yourself, some of the commentaries on, on the cry of dereliction I go in extraordinary directions. I read one, again, just, these are from, I'm sort of loath to name names, I don't want to do that, but from good evangelical types. Uh, one claiming that, that he didn't think that, that Christ was quoting Psalm 22 at all. Just a coincidence. Christ has not lost trust, though. Again, a common line. He's in despair. He doesn't understand what is going on. But no, Christ always trusts. There is no unbelief suddenly overtaking him. I, for one, I know people argue about this, but I, for one, cannot get my head around the idea that, that that Christ is quoting just one verse and meaning us to, to not think about the rest of the psalm as he does so. If you know Psalm 22, you'll know that it, it splits into, into two halves, essentially. And that at verse 22, that there is the turn. At the turn from the piercing, the tearing, the surrounding, the mocking, the death, to the resurrection. I will proclaim your name in the congregation to my brothers. Christ knows what is happening, why it's happening, and where he's going. No loss of faith on Christ's behalf. What about the idea that that God the Father then just in some way ceases to love the Son for those hours? Here's a quote from another author. We do not, however, imply that God was ever inimical, inimical, sorry, to Christ or angry toward him how could he be angry towards his beloved son in whom his heart delighted now, I'm not going to get you to call it out but who, who do you think might have said that let me just stick to the end of it 
We do not, however, insinuate, imply that God was angry towards him. Not angry towards him. How could he be angry towards his beloved son? What are names, what are names running through your head? Steve Chalk? Uh, liberal Anglican bishop, maybe. Choose your baddie. John Calvin. John Calvin. He goes on, how could Christ, by his intercession, appease the Father toward others if he were himself hateful to God? And that bit's crucial. Calvin understands that the, the pleasing nature of the atonement, the active working of Christ in atoning, if God suddenly hated Christ in his person, ceased to be pleased with him, then basically the cross, to put it crassly, no longer works. It's not a pleasing sacrifice anymore. No, the Father continues to delight in the Son. Even at Golgotha, even in the darkness. And yet, of course, and Calvin goes on to say this, Christ bore the severity, the divine severity, stricken and afflicted by God's hand, experienced all the signs of a wrathful and avenging God. We are in the darkness now and tiptoeing. But, but if you've lost me over the last few minutes, then, then, then so far, really, what I'm, what I'm trying to, to get at is that we, we shouldn't understand the cross in any way as Jesus changing the mind of an angry father. We shouldn't understand it in any way as father versus son. I said the other day that in our kind of um, conservative evangelical mythology, for want of a better word, um, th- there are various moments over the last hundred or so years that stories we, 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 we've been told about the, the heroic defenders of, of penal substitution and propitiation. And penal substitution and propitiation are at the heart of the cross. But there is a way of teaching them that implies that the love of God is a result of the cross rather than the cause of the cross. And that is tremendously significant. That there's a way of teaching penal substitution that, that, to put it crudely, goes something like this. God fundamentally, and we never say it like this, but this is the kind of tone, God fundamentally doesn't like you. He is against you. But there is a mechanism called the cross. There is a mechanism called penal substitution, which we defend against the baddies. And because of that mechanism, he is able to forgive you. He's legally obliged to. And again, it's not, I know it's not said like that. I think someone used the word, maybe Sinclair used the word tincture the other day. I don't quite know what that means, but I like it. It just the tone can be given that that okay, he does not like you, he doesn't really want you, but there is the cross, and therefore begrudgingly you can be forgiven. But Pull your socks up and dry harder. But of course, the cross is the result of the love of God. The cross doesn't make God love us. God loves us, and therefore the cross. And so we mustn't present the priestly ministry of Christ as making God love us. He loved you, and therefore there is the incredible priestly ministry of his son. So what is this cry about? We're still, what is this cry about? This deprivation that, that sin demands. How does Christ bear it? Well, first, of course, in his human nature. Hebrews 2.14. Christ bears this curse in his human nature. Hebrews 2.14. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. Because we are flesh and blood, Jesus had to partake of the same flesh and blood. In order that he might die for us, God cannot die. He is the immortal God after all. His suffering had to be human suffering. Again, not just because God cannot suffer, but because he must, Hebrews 5.1, represent us. Therefore, as Hebrews 2 goes on, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. 
Christ like you. Again, the importance of the, the person of Christ. Christ made like us in every respect. A real human body, yes, but a real human mind, a real human soul, real human emotions. Everything it means to be human, true of Christ. Sometimes people say, well, yes, apart from sin. You say, well, yes, apart from sin, but that's not what it means to be human. <laughs> sin is not part of the nature of humanity. It's a corruption of humanity. So the Son of God suffered on the cross, but he suffers according to his human nature. Each nature is essential. The suffering in the human nature, but it is the suffering of the person. Natures don't do things. We should never find ourselves saying Christ's human nature did this and Christ's divine nature did that. There's only one Christ. It's the Son of God, one person. But he suffers. The Son of God suffers in his human nature. And yet still, so you haven't answered the question, Jody, what does it mean to be forsaken? Some people want to say it just means left to die under the curse. It is Christ crying out, recognizing that he is not going to be pulled down. I think it is that, but I think we can tiptoe a little bit further into the darkness, cautiously. In the Old Testament at times, that the language of forsakenness is coupled with the language of, of the face being turned away. Just one verse for you, Deuteronomy 31, 17. If, if Israel should sin, then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them. See, the, the, the coupling together, anger, forsaking, and turning the face away. Okay, it's that deprivation of, of the goodness of God. The suspension of comfort, of joy. And I think that is what is going on in part at the cross. Here's a couple of the great and the good. It's hard to hear quotes, isn't it, from the front? So I'll try and keep them short. But here's Turretin. Christ's sense of the divine love was intercepted by the sense of the divine wrath and vengeance resting upon him. Now, straight away, Turretin goes on to, to clarify, God does not stop loving Jesus, but according to Christ's human nature, his experience, as it were, of God's wrath blocks his, his view of the Father's smiling face. Here's Goodwin. Only in respect of joy and comfort in and from God's face was Christ cut off. So he's still being, Christ is still being sustained in his human nature by God, kept in holiness by the divine will, as all men must be. But he has withdrawn from him all comfort from God's face. And it's hard to explain because we've never experienced it. Thank God. You cannot fully understand the atonement. And pray to God that, that you never do. There is the withdrawal. But also at the same time, remember the twin aspects of punishment that sin demands. There is the, the active punishment in body and soul. In body and soul, Christ bears the wrath of God, the torment of the cross, we're liable to skip over the physical, aren't we? We want to rush and say it's spiritual, not just physical. But that the physical is no small thing. We are physical people. All the images of hell we, we hear from the lips of Jesus. Fire, worm, torment. You feel them physically. How to explain the torment felt in the soul meeting God in wrath. I can't do it. But we know how terrifying it must have been. Again, if you lost me, all, all this means that we, we view Christ crucified in, in two ways. There, there, there's a dual aspect, if you like, to the cross. Christ is at the same time the beloved son. That does justice to the, the doctrines of the Trinity. The person of Christ, the pleasing sacrifice, the sweet aroma. And at the same time, he is the substitute, bearing God's wrath at sin. That does justice to the, the teaching on penal substitution, propitiation, judgment. And so Christ stands in dual relationship to God. As son, he knows by faith, again in his human nature, that God delighted in him. But as mediator, standing in our place, he, he knew and he experienced God's wrath at sin. Here's Goodwin again. Christ might look upon himself as a son and a natural son, and so beloved, 
He might look upon himself as a son and a son performing obedience to his father, even in suffering the wrath and never pleasing him more than now. Yet, this is at the same time, as a surety, so as the substitute for sinners, and so punished, in that respect, he might apprehend God for the present angry and full of wrath against him. A bit later, he says, even more simply, it is a wonder that God should never be more angry with his son than when he was most pleased with him. And again, you find these sort of two things going on in so many of the riders, the greater riders on the cross. Pink argues, never was God more well pleased with his beloved son than when he hung upon the cross in obedience to him. Yet he withdrew from him every effect or manifestation of his love during those three hours of awful darkness. Christ always has that dual aspect, the pleasing son, the wrath-bearing substitute. Hugh Martin, who wrote an incredible book on the atonement that I had to read about nine times before I half understood, but still is is incredible. Uh, He wrote this, The church flickers in her divine life and becomes shallow in her divine knowledge when she thinks she's ascertained all that's implied in the death of Christ. If, frankly, the last 15, 20 minutes has left you baffled, what is he on about? At the very least, can I encourage you, do not think of the cross as a doctrine to tidy way, put in your sort of tick list. There is always more. And so, Christ the priest satisfies the justice of God. He can cry out, it is finished. The wrath is exhausted. And that that is our hope, isn't it? God's justice satisfied entirely. And it satisfies that Calvary at Golgotha. Not in your life, in any way. A few... A few nights ago, I was working at home, and I have got an office. I was working in a little kind of box room upstairs, uh, and my kids were asleep, and they listened to these, um, they listened to bedtime stories. So they were listening to Enid Blyton, and um, uh, it was one of the stories from The Faraway Tree. Have you ever read those? Totally insane stories. Um, if Johnny thinks Meredith Klein was smoking something when he wrote his commentaries on Genesis, it's got nothing on, on Enid Blyton and The Faraway Tree. I wasn't listening to the story, but just suddenly these words drifted down the corridor. Yeah, and I realize this is moving from the sublime to the ridiculous, but stay with me. So these words, there was a tiny goblin. Okay, didn't see that coming, did he? There was a tiny goblin who had once done a wicked thing and couldn't forget it. He wanted to know the secret of forgetting. And that is one of the most difficult secrets in the world if you've done something really bad. Now, the reason that line hit hit me is precisely because of the utter banality of everything else that Enid Blyton writes. She turned turned out about 50 books a year. Um, I I read up a little bit on her afterwards, and she she described her her writing process as, as I close my eyes, put my typewriter on my lap, empty my thoughts, and just begin typing. I don't think at all. (laughs) Absolutely cracking. Only bettered by a man who can get his secretary and wife to type up 19th century Irish Puritans uh, and then publish them under his own name. Um, it's her, her under, sorry, Johnny. Um, <laughs> she described it as her undermined, and that is fascinating, I think. So I, I, put, that, I put that quote, in, quote into the internet, and, and, and it is the one line that anyone has ever picked up in, in Blyton's 900 odd books as her betraying herself. If you know anything about her life, she, she, she did some bad things. She was a very troubled lady. And those, who, <laughs> those who've taken an interest think that just for that one moment, among all the triviality of Noddy and Big Ears and the Secret Seven and Timmy and the Famous Five, and all, just for a moment, something deep in her subconscious slipped out. The guilt surfaced. The undermined revealed itself. He wanted to know the secret of forgetting. And that is one of the most difficult secrets in the world if you've done something really bad. But there is a secret, isn't there? 
the Lord God has put our sins behind his back. There may well be things, and I'm, I'm not here to preach really, but there are things you wish you could forget. Praise God, they were forgotten at Calvary. But God has buried them at the bottom of the ocean, put them behind his back. For those of you who are preachers, that is our, our job, is it not? It's to say it is finished. It was done at Calvary to persuade and encourage people to look to Christ crucified, not to themselves. One of the most helpful things I've ever seen in just, just helping me to preach, utterly simple. And again, you might, you, know, you might think, what on earth? You know, how did this help you? But just a simple diagram in a book. On one page, there was a picture, a diagram of Christ on the cross. Okay, I know we don't like images of Christ, but just stick man, stay with it. I'm not showing you the picture. Christ on the cross. On, on the flip side uh, was a picture of a, dis, of, a, of a person looking at Christ on the cross. And the, the author said, we all say we want to preach Christ crucified, but actually what we spend most of our time preaching is the necessity of looking at Christ crucified or the necessity of following Christ crucified or the necessity of having faith in Christ crucified as if faith was something you were kind of trying to engineer in yourself. To, in other words, our preaching is full of the second picture, describing what it looks like to, to be a person who looks at the cross. And actually, if you want to have hopeful disciples, disciples who know what it is to forget, then preach Christ crucified. It is finished. And yet his priestly work is not finished. His atoning work is finished, but his priestly work is not. So for the rest of our time, we'll think about the exalt exaltation of Christ in his priestly work. There is, of course, no need for renewing the sacrifices. He's died once and for all, as we're told it in Hebrews, endlessly. No more sacrificing uh, for his ministry. But he is still, again, in the words of Hebrews, a priest forever. He doesn't cease to be a priest. We simply move from redemption accomplished to redemption applied. And again, to pick up the, the, the typology that the priests in the days of the Mosaic Covenant did not just sacrifice out on the bronze altar in the courtyard, but also entered the tabernacle to keep the incense burning in the holy place. And so Christ enters uh, the true holy place, the true tabernacle, enters heaven on our behalf. He is present in heaven. And even the presence of Christ is a great comfort to a believer. The, the, the presence of Christ beyond the curtain in the holy place, at the right hand of the Father. And before we think about what he's doing, I think it's Horton who says that, that Christ is not just God with us or God for us, but he's now us with God. Remember the high priest had on his breastplate that the 12 stones with each of the 12 tribes of Israel, the same on his, on his shoulders. So as he walked into the most holy place, he carried the people with him. And it's just a picture of what Christ has done. It's what we've sung, isn't it? Behold him there. 1 John 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. The sacrifice has been made once and for all. But you will still sin when you do. You don't need to be re-atoned for. But you do need to look and see there is one righteous at the Father's right hand who represents you, who has borne you in there. And what is he doing? He's praying, interceding. And the, 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 the atonement and the intercession of Christ are, are inseparable. Hugh Martin again, he says this, the essence of the intercession is atonement, and the atonement is essentially an intercession. It's not one job, finished, tied it away, done, totally new job. But it is all priestly work. Uh, Romans 8, 34, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed, indeed is interceding for us. Hebrews 7, 25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to, lives to make intercession for them. 
that the intercede word is the, the petition word. That's all it means to intercede. It's, it's to ask. And therefore, although the, the nature of Christ's petitions has, has presumably changed, his, his heavenly intercession is, is a continuation of his uh, earthly prayers. And, and some people don't like this. They don't like the idea of, of, of how, can, how can Christ, the Son of God, intercede? You know, how can God intercede with God? But in the same ways we say it's the person of, of Christ who, who suffered but did so according to his human nature, can we not say that it's the person of the Son of God who intercedes, but it's only the, the, through his human nature that, that he supplicates? He's our advocate, just as he was our propitiation. Others feel, that isn't this undermining the once and for allness of Calvary? And it could do, depending on how you understand the ongoing intercession. Again, I found Hugh Martin really helpful here. Go read him later. But he asked the question, is the intercession, is it either Christ influencing God to bless us, or is it Christ presenting a plea that God's plan has come to fruition, and therefore he can now justly bless us in a way that he couldn't otherwise? And Martin says it's, it's that latter one. It can't be Christ influencing God. That would split the will of the Trinity as if Father and Son were pitted against each other. It would make nonsense of the idea that, that Christ was appointed to the office of priest. Why would God appoint a priest to basically badger him if he didn't want to, to bless anyway? It would undermine the goodness of God, says Martin, that blessing needs to be wrung out of him by this human representative. It would even undermine the justice of God because Personal influence shouldn't affect just actions. So the intercession, is, it's not a, a twisting of God's arm by the son, by the mediator. It's not that God was unwilling, but is now willing. Rather, Christ is bringing the completed work of his earthly ministry before God in a way that means God can now bless his people without compromising his justice. And so again, quite a few older writers compare uh, atonement and intercession to creation and providence. Creation and atonement are once and for all acts, done, dusted. But the second, intercession and providence, are the kind of ongoing action on the basis of the completed first action. Uh, it's like at, at the cross, at the atonement, Christ won the the jewels, the chest of jewels, and in, in, in the intercession, he dispenses them, or he asks the Father to dispense the jewels to his people. Now, what is Christ asking for? Everything you need to be saved to the uttermost, to use the language of Hebrews. Now, all the blessings won at Golgotha come ultimately as a result of Christ's intercession. At the right to them, comes from the atonement, but the possession of them comes through the intercession. I think it's Gavin Ortland. I get all the Ortlands confused. There's so many of them. Um, I think it's Gavin Ortland uh, who, who calls the intercession the voice of Christ's blood. Everything you need for your journey home will come from the Father because they've been earned at Calvary, and now Christ is active as a priest, making sure that you receive everything you need. He goes on, this is Ortland. Thus the doctrine of Christ's intercession provides a vantage point by which to see how the grace of God meets particular sins at particular points in time. It doesn't merely cover my life as a whole, leaving the details to work out on their own. Christ meets us again and again in our particular moments of lust, resentment, fear, negligence, coldness, and says, Father, forgive them for the sake of my blood. You prefer older writers. Here's Charnock. It's upon every sin that he doth discharge this office, and by his interposition procures our pardon thousands of times and preserves us from coming short of the full fruits of reconciliation at first obtained by him. Neither are men wanting to undermine the atonement in any way, but both understand the ongoing work of Christ to bless you in your hour, your minute, your moment of need. John Murray, the intercession of Christ is interposed to meet every need of the believer. No grace bestowed, no blessing enjoyed, no benefit received can be removed from the scope of the intercession. If 
By the way, this is one, it's not the most significant thing for right now, but it, it was one of the reasons why I think you have to say the atonement was definite, particular. Because the atone, the, sorry, the intercession is certainly particular. Why is it that you are a, a Christian today? Why is it that you are born again? Why is it you received the, the Spirit? Because Christ has brought your name to the Father and said, Father, I have died for Joe. I've bought the right to the gift of your Spirit for Joe. And therefore, Joe is born again. We, we know Christ ha- has not, for whatever reason, had not said that about every human being who has ever lived. Because the Father does not deny the Son. The intercession is certainly particular. And therefore, it would be very strange if the atonement wasn't. All of which to say is your salvation is safe in his hands from beginning to end. Now, there's more we might say about the, the ongoing priestly work of Christ. The, the intercession, I think, doesn't cover it all. We could think about the, the praise of Christ. Psalm 22, again, I, I will lead the congregation. I will sing praises to you, Father, in, in, the, in the midst of the congregation. Christ is the, the worship leader for his people, ultimately. Uh, but Jonathan has covered that uh, marvelously well. Uh, all I can add is, uh, just, as, I suppose, a suggestion in terms of getting it into the, the congregation. One of the things I used to do, I stopped um, writing these talks, maybe think about it again. I've stopped doing it because they, they wised up to it. But I used to ask the kids at church, um, where is it you go to church? And they would say, you know, Woodhouse Community Center or whatever it was. And I'd say, where else do you go to church? And eventually they got it. Eventually they learned to say, heaven. Always in two places. Being led by Christ. Hebrews 12. I really want to finish by thinking about the priestly patience of Christ. What is the purpose of all this, other than to see that the, the astounding love at work in our Savior? Come with me to Mark 1. pretty sure this isn't orthodox, but I, I sometimes feel like I only want to read the Psalms and the Gospels, or rather they're, they're what keep me alive. And when you read through the Gospels, I think it, it, it's such a help to have these, this understanding of Christ as prophet, priest, king in, in your mind, and, and seeing the richness of the encounters of, between Christ and, and all those who come to him. Uh, so in Mark 1, we and verse 40, we, we read of this unclean man, this leper, Mark 1, 40, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling, said to him, if you will, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will, I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see, you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. Here is Christ the priest at work. Someone comes to him, not with a medical disease, but an uncleanliness. Leprosy was one of those things that made you unclean. Essentially, in the Levitical system, uncleanliness came from touching a dead body or from emissions from within the body, menstruation, emissions of semen, leprous skin breaking out, probably because those things are symbolic of death. Death is the ultimate uncleanness. But perhaps too because what comes from within, a picture of what comes from within is real uncleanness, as Jesus himself will say. It's really, in Mark 7, really what makes us unclean is what comes out of the heart. So the, the, the oozing of blood the oozing of pus, the emissions of semen from within. They are ceremonially unclean, but just a picture of the real moral uncleanness that dwells within your heart. So we see ourselves in the leper. And again, he doesn't doubt God's power, does he? Christ's power 
If you are willing, you can make me clean. His doubts are over the willingness. There is the leper, isolated, unable to come to worship, unable to enter really into the presence of others. Are you willing? I am willing. Be clean. Not be healed, be clean. Cleansing, priestly work. I am willing, Christ says, for the unclean. The priestly work of Christ drives us to see, reminds us to see, welcomes us to see. He desire to forgive. You don't need to cleanse yourself and then come, but you come dirty and he will clean, clean you. A friend of mine's a missionary doctor out in Madagascar. And he was telling me the other day about a, a particular problem they have. And I, again, I'm no medic. Uh, but he wrote, uh, and he said this, we get women with uh, vesicovaginal fistulas who suffer for 20 years because they're too ashamed to come for treatment because they fear the reaction. What have you done to get this way? They fear it, it exposing themselves, showing the problem they have, showing what they're really like. And yet all along the hospital is there willing and ready to heal them, to treat them. And his observation was, that's, that's what we're like, isn't it? There is a doctor who's willing. <laughs> he wants to cleanse. What we need to do is just come. In the, in the, the liturgy uh, at church uh, up in Leeds, one of the things we've, I've started doing more and more, more recently uh, alongside having the, the law to convict us of our sin, it, it, it is having, before we confess our sins, something to remind us of the forgiving character of God. That the prodigal son, uh, Psalm 86, you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Because our, our problem is we do not think he will forgive. <laughs> And the great question, for those of you who lead services, it's the great question is, how, how can we get Adam out of the bush? Most people know they're guilty. And our reaction is to follow Adam into the bushes and hide. The difficulty, the great difficulty of persuading the human heart that it is safe to come out of the bushes and come to God. Because when you do so, you'll find mercy rather than judgment and torment. And so for all that I'm on board with the idea of reading the law, the Ten Commandments, the summaries of the law, or whatever it may be to convict us of sin, I, I do feel the need to, before the, the comfort, the, the, the absolution we pronounce afterwards, to say to people too, it is safe, come out of the bushes. This is what your God is like. This is what Christ is like. This is the priest who has come to cleanse you. You don't need to bring anything with you. Leave the, leave the fig leaves in the bush and come. It is the only safe place. Where else are you going to go? Come to a God who is running towards you. Uh, liturgy is quite new for, for most of us um, up in Leeds. Set prayers. Sometimes people say to me, I just, I don't know if I, I, I read the confession, I don't know if I feel as sorry for my sin as I should be. No, you don't. <laughs> I can assure you, you don't. <laughs> but you're not saved by the strength of your feeling of sorrow for your sin. Uh, when I head off into a kind of dark depression over this, my wife, so many times, takes me back to the prodigal son and, and, and the son walking home with his speech, you know, Father, I'm not worthy to. And the father doesn't let him get a word, runs across and embraces. And she says to me, he's running towards you, Chauncey, to embrace you. All your sins, your guilt, failings, doubts, exacerbated by the fact you're a minister. He is running towards you. You can come out of the bush. Uh, where I grew up in Dorset, there was a signpost at one corner between, between three of the villages, three-directional signpost, and it was red, blood red. A sort of old finger post kind of signpost. And the reason it was blood, blood red was it was on the site, supposedly, where, where Judge Jeffreys executed uh, many of the rebels who joined Monmouth in an attempt to overthrow James II. At the bloodier sizes. And so the story is told that, that, one, of the, that one of the nobles who, who joined Monmouth in, in rebelling against James II was captured by James and refused to ask for mercy. And James got angry with him and said to him, 
do you not realize it is in my power to forgive you? And the noble said, aye, I do, but it's not in your character. Brave. That's what we fear, isn't it? We know God is powerful. But is it, his, is it in his character? Thank God it is. Because the, prophetic, the, the priestly work of Christ is not the twisting of the arm of a fundamentally angry and against you deity who will begrudgingly have to let some rebels into heaven, but rather is the result of a loving God who desires to gather the wandering sheep, to cleanse the leprous sinners, to welcome them home with wide open arms, them carrying nothing, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. And he has. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe. Help us overcome our unbelief. We pray to you as, as the great prophet of the church that you would strengthen and grow in us the knowledge of your love, the knowledge of your willingness to cleanse leprous sinners. Take us out of ourselves so we, we don't look uh, to our, our performance and righteousness, the, the zeal of our obedience, the strength of our repentance, but, but look to your grace, your love, your mercy alone as your arms extended at Calvary. Lord, make haste to help us, make speed to save us. And might we delight in the everlasting arms uh, that hold us up. Might we delight in the everlasting welcome that awaits us and the love of our Savior. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.